Have you ever walked into a room and found a vampire? No, not the sexy kind, but a foul creature with bony limbs and ashen sin. The kind that snarls as you enter, like a beast about to pounce. The kind that roots you to the spot with its sunken, hypnotic eyes, rendering you unable to flee as you watch the hideous thing uncoil from the shadows. Has your heart started racing through your legs, refused to? Have you felt time slow as the creature crosses the room in the darkness of a blink? Have you shuddered with fear when it places one clawed hand atop your head and another under your chin so it can tilt you, exposing your neck? Have you squirmed as its rough, dry tongue slides down your cheek, over your jaw, to your throat, in a slithering search that's seeking your artery? Have you felt its hot breath release in a hiss against your skin when it probes your pulse, the flow that leads to your brain? Has its tongue rested there, throbbing slightly, as if savouring the moment? Have you then experienced a sinking, sucking blackness as you discover that not all vampires feed on blood? Some feed on memories. Well, have you? Maybe not. But let me rephrase the question. Have you ever walked into a room and suddenly forgot why you came in? There was no pearly gate. The only reason I knew I was in a cave was because I had just passed the entrance. The rock wall rose behind me with no ceiling in sight. I knew this was it. This was what religion talked about. What man feared. I had just entered the gate to hell. I felt the presence of the cave as if it were a living, breathing creature. The stench of rotten flesh overwhelmed me. Then there was a voice. It came from inside and all around. Welcome. Who are you? I asked, trying to keep my composure. You know, the thing answered. I did know. You are the devil, I stuttered, quickly losing my composure. Why me? I've lived as good as I could. The silence took over the space as my words died out. It seemed like an hour went by before the response came. What did you expect? The voice was penetrating but patient. I don't know. I never believed any of this, I uttered. Is that why I'm here? Silence. I continued. They say the greatest trick you ever pulled was convincing the world you don't exist. No. The greatest trick I ever pulled was convincing the world that there is an alternative. There is no God, I shivered. The cave trembled with the words, I am God. It was 1am and Guy Halverston sat in his dark living room. He hadn't moved for over an hour. The accident earlier that evening kept playing over and over in his mind. The light turned red but he was in a hurry and accelerated. An orange blur came from his right, and in a split second there was a violent jolt. Then the bicyclist rolled across his hood and fell out of sight on the pavement. Horns blared angrily, and he panicked, stepping on the gas and screeching away from the chaos into the darkness, shaken and keeping an eye on his rearview mirror until he got home. Why did you run, you idiot? You've never committed a crime before this and punished himself by imagining years in jail, his career gone, his family gone, his future gone. Why not just go to the police right now? You can afford a lawyer. Then someone tapped on the front door and his world suddenly crumbled away beneath him. They found me. There was nothing he could do but answer it. Running would only make matters worse. His body trembled. He got up, went to the door and opened it. A police officer stood under the porch light. Mr. Halverson? asked the grim officer. He let out a defeated sigh. Yes, let me. I'm terribly sorry, but I'm afraid I have some bad news. Your son's bike was struck by a hit and run driver this evening. He died at the scene. I'm very sorry for your loss. On Monday, I came up with the perfect plan. No one even knew we were friends. On Tuesday, he stole the gun from his dad. On Wednesday, 
we decided to make our move during the following day's pep rally. On Thursday, while the entire school was in the gym, we waited just outside the doors. I was to use the gun on whoever walked out first. Then he would take the gun and go into the gym blasting. I walked up to Mr. Quinn, the guidance counsellor, and shot him in the face three times. He fell back into the gym, dead. The shots were deafening. We heard screams in the auditorium. No one could see us yet. I handed him the gun and whispered, Your turn. He ran into the gym and started firing. I followed a moment later. He hadn't hit anyone yet. Kids were scrambling and hiding. It was mayhem. I ran up behind him and tackled him. We struggled. I wrenched the gun out of his hands, turned it on him and killed him. I closed his mouth forever. On Friday, I was anointed a hero. It was indeed the perfect plan. When my sister Betsy and I were kids, our family lived for a while in a charming old farmhouse. We loved exploring its dusty corners and climbing the apple tree in the backyard. But our favourite thing was the ghost. We called her mother because she seemed so kind and nurturing. Some mornings Betsy and I would wake up and on each of our nightstands we'd find a cup that hadn't been there the night before. Mother had left them there, worried that we'd get thirsty during the night. She just wanted to take care of us. Among the house's original furnishings was an antique wooden chair, which we kept against the back wall of the living room. Whenever we were preoccupied watching TV or playing a game, Mother would inch that chair forward across the room toward us. Sometimes she'd manage to move it all the way to the centre of the room. We always felt sad putting it back against the wall. Mother just wanted to be near us. Years later, long after we moved out, I found an old newspaper article about the farmhouse's original occupant, a widow. She'd murdered her two children by giving them each a cup of poisoned milk before bed. Then she'd hanged herself. The article included a photo of the farmhouse's living room, with a woman's body hanging from a beam. Beneath her, knocked over, was the old wooden chair, placed exactly in the centre of the room. If God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? It's a common question, but it is misplaced. All things must have a balance. Light and dark, good and evil, sound and silence. Without one, the other cannot exist. So if that's true, then God does nothing to fight evil. That might be your follow-up question. Of course he fights evil, relentlessly. I am a Dartalian, one of his most holy and righteous angels. I roam the earth, disposing of evil wherever I find it. I kill the monsters you don't even want to know about. I crush them completely so you can sleep at night. But humans have no idea of how many of you live because of the work I do. But what about Stalin, Hitler, Ted Bundy, Jack the Ripper? Well, those are the minor ones I had to let live, for balance. The ones I destroy are too horrible and vile to survive. What's funny is while I would wager you never heard the name D'Artagnan in any religious text, I bet you have heard of me. Americans, for example, have their own name for me. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. <laughs>